This, in this video segment, I'm going to try to walk you through the uh, equations, models, and metrics that I've used in the using CAPM and WAC in class problem. This is primarily going to benefit those of you that um, have, for, for whom it's been a while since you may have taken uh, Finance 300 or uh, or for whom uh, just some of these models and metrics have gotten a little bit rusty. So, so for this, uh, I want to first walk through how I came about some of this initial setup that we have so that you, you see some of these initial values. And so let me let me just kind of think this through with you. I'll make comments here about uh, how you may be uh, able to use Excel to do some of this, as well as how you might be able to use your HP uh, financial calculator to do some of this. So in this uh, three-column structure that I've put together here for you, I have a column representing the cash flows uh, and the various years, of course, uh, but I also uh, have gone ahead and worked those cash flows into their individual present values, and then I've accumulated those present values into this uh, this other column. So for year zero, I'm supposing that there's an investment of $10 million. That's why we see a negative $10 million in year zero. And uh, and then in years one, two, and three, as per uh, the story that you might have seen in one of the other in-class problems where we looked at scenario analysis and such, where we uh, originally developed this particular story of Don Treader, uh, we see that there's a negative cash flow of $5 million a year. Don't confuse that negative amount in years one, two, and three in this particular case with an investment. These are negative cash flows. The investment is happening in year zero, and that is uh, at $10 million. Um, and then in years four through 13, we have positive cash flows starting at $3,500, or uh, $3,500,000, and moving all the way up to $18,700,000 and change. The way that I'm getting these cash flow starting in year four is I'm taking information from the story that I've given you, uh, wherein we, we knew that we had a $3,500,000 cash flow in year four. And then for years four through eight, we're expanding that cash flow uh, by 35%, which happens to have been part of the original story. So 3,000,005 becomes 4,000,007 becomes 6,000,003 and so on. And then in years 9 through 13, uh, we take the value uh, that we got in year 8, expand it by 10%. So that becomes uh, 12,007,000, 14,000,000, uh, 15,000,000, and uh, 12,000,000, and then 13,000,000. Excuse me, uh, 12 million and then all the way through through 18,000,000, excuse me. So, so to get these cash flows, I'm just using the information in the story. And I realize you don't see the entirety of the original story here, but if you look at the, um, at the footnotes, you can see more detail on it. And if you want yet further detail, take a look at the in-class problem that is the scenario analysis, uh, scenario sensitivity analysis problem that gives you the original story that we've told here. So these are the cash flows. We, we're looking at the possibility of valuing this investment at $10 million. So we're going to think about that as the, the investment amount that we would put in. We recognize it has a $5 million negative cash flow each year uh, for the first three years, then has a positive cash flow of $3,500,000, which positive cash flow expands by 35%. That's our G for years four through eight. Uh, then it expands by 10%, our G for years 8 through 13, uh, 9 through 13, excuse me, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. Beyond that, and you're not seeing it in this row, these rows or columns, beyond that, this uh, investment is projected to expand at 8%. 
uh, cash flow each year. Well, if I put those into the cash flow register of my HP 10 calculator, and we can do that, of course, by just inputting the dollar amount, say negative $10 million, and then hit the CFJ function, it accepts that for year zero. If we then go ahead and put in negative $5 million and hit the CFJ function again, it accepts it for year one. Hit it again, accepts it for year two. Touch it again, accepts it for year three. And then put in $3,500,000. Touch CFJ again, it accepts it that positive amount for year four, and so on. Continue to simply add these numbers uh, or input these numbers into your calculator. Uh, touch the CFJ button, and it is it is filling the cash flow register of your HP calculator. Or if you're doing it on Excel, uh, then you create this second column. I'm going to move to the Excel spreadsheet. Hopefully, I'll be able to highlight some uh, uh, highlight some of the um, of the cells for you. So as I as I do this, uh, here you see my original cells, my original cash flows that I've simply input. Uh, actually, to input these, and you have access to this uh, this spreadsheet. When I input these, I was a little bit more sophisticated. I went ahead and just input the dollar amounts as were indicated in the story for years zero through four. And year four was the first year in which I had a positive cash flow. In year five, I didn't input the cash flow itself. I, I said, uh, we're taking the cash flow from year four and we are now, uh, we are now going ahead and expanding it by one plus what is in cell C5. Well, C5 is 35%. So one plus 0.35. So we're expanding it at 35% for year five, six, seven, and eight. You see uh, the same exact notations. Year nine, I'm now taking what's in this cell, uh, B17, and I'm expanding that by what is in uh, cell C6, which is 10%, or 1 plus 0 0.10, so I'm expanding that amount. And I do that same thing then for each of these years, um, 11, 12, and 13. In the second column, I, I have the discounted present value of the amount that I have in the first column. Well, to do the discounted present value, I'm going to take this amount divided by 1 plus R, and our R, or discount factor, is 0.2 in this case. So 1 plus R to the power of the year designation, in this case 0. Anything to the power of 0 is 1. So we're going to end up at 10 million divided by 1.2 to the power of 0, or 10 million divided by 1. And I do the same thing in year uh, 1 for the year 1 cash flow. I've divided this by 1.2 to the power of 1 and the same thing in years two and so on. And this gives me the discounted present value in today or current dollars of the cash flow in the respective years. In the next column, I'm simply giving a sum of what's happening in the first column. So uh, in this column, I said, OK, we're just going to take whatever is in this first column and bring it here in the next row. I'm saying, okay, we're going to take the value here and add this value to it. And in the next row, I'm taking the value here and adding this value to it and so on. So I'm simply creating a summation to the point that by the, by year 13, we've gone from the negative 10 million, our investment, which then actually is falling by 5 million a year because of a negative cash flow. And then it begins to climb because we have this cash flow that's positive that's building. And to the point where by the end of year 13, we have a positive cash flow, even in consideration of the expected rate of return or the discount rate of 0.2, we have a positive cash flow of $789,000. And so that's what you see taking place in these columns. To think about what's happening then with the net present value, IRR, and payback, I'm going to go back to the spreadsheet for a moment. And here we see that I have an internal rate of return of 20.6%. Well, recall that we input our uh, cash flows into 
our HP calculator. If we then input the um, uh, the uh, if we, if we then just go ahead with those cash flows and solve for net present value, which is going to be the redshift key and then the uh, NPV, it doesn't give us anything because we need to tell it what rate we're trying to target. And in this case, we're trying to target 0.2% or 20%, excuse me. So we're going to put uh, a 20 and then the redshift key or excuse me, we're going to put 20 and then uh, simply put the I divided by YR key, so 20%. And that then has told it we have this series of cash flows. We're going to be discounting them at 20%. It knows the years because every time we touch the cash flow button, that was one more period. Uh, it knows the present value because we told that uh, year zero was negative $10 million. It knows the payments. We've been putting them in with each of the cash flows. And so now if we simply touch the red key and then the NPV key, it gives us the net present value, which is going to be, not surprisingly, $789,067.81. Well, what you see here is that this tabulation column having summed all of these, this actually gives us the same thing as the net present value because we're starting with our negative. In this case, our cash flows are then negative for three years and then positive. We're adjusting them for their present values and then we're summing them and that gives us the exact same dollar amount, just as one would expect. And we see when we think about the IRR though, if we go ahead then and instead of solving for net present value, if we just touch the red key and then solve for IRR divided by YR, that would give us 20.6%. So we just kept the, the notations that we put into the cash flow register. We told then the calculator uh, to go ahead and touch or to go ahead and give us the internal rate of return, which effectively then holds the, the discount rate at zero uh, because you will recall that the internal rate of return is the rate that we receive on a series of cash flows presuming that the net present value is zero. So, so those are a little bit about the keystrokes. If you think about how we're doing this in the, uh, in Excel, you'll see that, uh, the internal rate of return is simply designated by saying equal IRR and then picking up the data in cells, uh, nine through 22 or rows 9 through 22 of column B, well, that's the initial negative cash flow, which is our investment. That's what we're getting a rate of return on to have this internal rate of return. And then the negative 5 million and so on. Uh, and it's giving us then the internal rate of return that that gave us for these years, assuming that the net present value was zero. If we want to think about how to get the net present value then uh, in uh, in Excel, then we go ahead and use then the initial uh, investment of B9 plus the net present value of that which happens um, in in rows B10 through B22, rows and cells B10 through B22, 10 through 22, given an investment or discount rate that is in C4 of 0.2. So B9 plus the net present value, parenthesis, give it the rate, comma, give it then the range of values that you're wanting it to use, and then, um, uh, excuse me, and then it calculates the net present value for us. Note here that this was a slightly different keystroke series than in the IRR, which we just put IRR and then gave it the whole series and range. Here we had to tell it, uh, had to tell um, Excel, uh, we want to take the original value, the investment, which is a negative, uh, plus the net present value, given some uh, rate, which in this case was 0.2, of some range of, of cells, which is B10 to B22, and then it will calculate it for us. For some reason, if you simply said NPV 
uh, than the rate and then picked up C9, or rather B9, through B22, it doesn't give you the uh, accurate uh, outcome. I'm not sure why that is in Excel, but it, but it doesn't. So, so that's what you're looking at here. If we then look a little bit further under this discounted cash flow or present value of the DCF, present value of the discounted cash flow, well, now when we're thinking about the cash flows, we're not thinking about the investment that we've made. We're just on the flows themselves. And so we ignore the investment made and simply look at the cash flows themselves. So if we think about what's in this, what is in this cell, it is the net present value simply of uh, B, uh, B10 through B13, and then that gave us the, um, the net present value, or rather that gave us the, the present value of the discounted cash flow of 10,789,67. Well, if you think about it, that's the 789,67 without having been reduced by the $10 million investment. So, so you can see the correlation here. If we look at the continuing value, which is in uh, tipping continuing value using a dividend growth equation, uh, you might recall that the dividend growth equation is P0 is equal to D1 divided by R minus G. Well, P0, or price at time 0, we'll say value at time 0, is equal to some income amount divided by R minus G. Well, to get that income amount then, we had to think about what is the income amount at time one. If we want a value at time zero, which happens to be year 13, <coughs> in this case, what's the income amount at time zero? Well, it was then the income amount at time 13. Rather, what's the income amount at time one? Excuse me. It's the income amount at time 13 expanded by 8%. So if you look at the equation here in this cell, I first take the uh, take the value in B22. I times it by one plus C7. So I've expanded this value by eight uh, percent. I then take and divide that by C4 minus C7 or R minus G, which was R minus then the ongoing G that we have for years 14 plus. And it gave us then a value of 168,503,549 and some pennies. Well, remember that that is a value at time zero, price at time zero. And time zero in this case is year 13, because that's when we are assessing this as of, this continuing value. And if you don't recall the concept of continuing value from Finance 300 or don't recall how you manipulate the, uh, this particular discounted cash flow or uh, this particular um, uh, dividend growth model, in this case it's an income augmented dividend growth model, then you might want to refer back to some of the notes on that that you have or perhaps ask me about it. But this is the model that we're using for this particular uh, metric. We're going to use a different one in a few minutes perhaps. But when you take a look at that, uh, it, that is telling us a price based on, upon an income at time one. Well, and a price at time zero based on an income at time one. Well, income at time one was year 14, which we don't show here, but we took the income at year or cash flow at year 13, increased it by the growth rate for years 14 plus, and then called that the income at time one. Uh, we divided that by R minus G, and that gave us some value at time zero. Well, if year 14 is time one, year 13 is time zero. We now need to think about what's the present value of this continuing value. And so we now have to take that and, as you might expect, discount that back, discount that back to the current day. And we do that by taking the value, or what would have been then in C28, here, the continued value of the dividend growth equation, uh, and then we're going to discount that value back by dividing it by one plus uh, one plus r to the t. 
Well, R is uh, C4. Remember that that was 0.2. And the T that we're dealing with then is the number of years to get it back to today's value. So that was 13. So we divided it by 1.2 to the 13th. We took the continuing value of the dividend growth, which lived at time 13. That was its time zero. We then discounted it back to today by using our discount factor of 0.2. So we divided it by 1.2. 0.2 to the 13th, and that brought it back to a current value in today's dollars of 15748995 And then to get the final value here, we, uh, we take the present value of the discounted cash flow plus the present value of the continuing value, which is simply the PV of the DCF plus the PV of the CV, and then we add those together, and that gives us a value of 26538063 so that's a little bit about how I got these initial values. Uh, hopefully that's going to help. We will continue on and look at each, now, each of the questions now uh, by, um, uh, in, in continuing video segments.